All right, well, good evening, and welcome to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. My name is Aaron Espinoza, and I am the Library and Observatory Director. Uh, so I want to welcome you guys. Well, thank you. I want to welcome you to uh, our program tonight, a Community and the Cosmos, the Rancho Mirage Observatory's the first five years. Uh, if I can ask everybody to just take a moment and silence your cell phones, please. All right. All right. Um, so if you're not aware already, uh, Saturday, uh, this last Saturday, March 25th, was our official fifth anniversary. Um, and although I can't see many of you, uh, how many of you were actually with us on March 25th, 2018 for our dedication? All right, I see a few hands over here. Well, that's fantastic. Um, one of the things I'm trying not to do in my introduction is repeat some of the things that Eric's going to talk about, but I do want to welcome you, uh, for those of you that were here, and thank you for your continued support. Um, just a few stats since our grand opening. Uh, the observatory uh, tours have welcomed over 10,400 people. Our stargazing programs have welcomed over 14,500 people. A program that you're going to learn a little bit more about, our Connecting Children to the Stars, has welcomed over 25 stu or 2,500 students to the observatory and our library. And another program you're going to get to learn a little bit more about is uh, we have welcomed or we have uh, checked out 500 telescopes uh, through a generous grant that we've received. Um, just a little bit about the uh, observatory. Um, I get questions about how the funding is happening. Um, very simply, the Library and Observatory, administrative, maintenance, and actual equipment is covered by the City of Rancho Mirage through the Library and Observatory Fund. Our observatory programming, our summer reading club, and any of our collection development that is done through or about astronomy and science is done through our foundation. Our foundation is what supports all of our amazing programs through the library and observatory. Um, so if you haven't already, please help support us so that we can continue to keep these amazing things going on. A few, pro uh, a few uh, things that we've been doing um, off-site stargazing, uh, stargazing parties. We've done stargazing parties at Sunnylands, the Ritz-Carlton, La Quinta Resort, and Betty Ford Foundation. Um, how many of you have actually seen, and I'm trying to see hands here, have seen our science-based music video that we were a part of. All right, we're gonna make sure that we share that uh, in the next few uh, days here, because uh, it was actually a very good video um, done by uh, one of our donors, uh, Patrick Olson. Um, how many of you knew that we were part of the Bachelorette, one of our, the dating, uh, one of the dates? Didn't even, did someone say woo? -hoo? Fantastic. Um, so that was something that was exciting for us. Um, the YouTube sensation, uh, Try Guys, um, although they were, uh, they've had a little turmoil lately, uh, we were part of their uh, episode as well. Um, and then just recently, we were highlighted as number six under the Palm Springs uh, umbrella in the New York Times Best 52 Places to Visit in 2023. Um, so some exciting uh, things happening here at the uh, observatory. Tonight's lecture, we kick off our fifth anniversary, but we are only kicking it off. We have many more programs, lectures, and films being scheduled. Although I cannot name names as of yet, the lectures that we have coming are some current and former NASA staff and administration. So stay tuned for some more information on that coming up. Uh, five years ago, when we opened, our, we themed our summer reading club, Reading Through the Universe. And to celebrate our fifth anniversary, this year's theme is Read for the Stars, which will take place from June 12th through August 8th. So please look out for more information. I saw a few young ones here. We do have a lot of programming, but our summer reading club is for those that are young and young at heart. I do want to take a special uh, time to say thank you to a few key people. Our city council, although they could not be in attendance tonight, it is our city council's vision and continued forethought that has allowed us to build and develop such an amazing facility uh, just across the walkway here. To our city managers of Randy Biner, uh, Binder, who was here uh, at our opening, and our current city manager, Isaiah Hagerman, our library and observatory advisory commission, 
Uh, I'd like to take a moment, and I don't know if she's in the room right now, but uh, we have an observatory program coordinator, Lauren Zuckerberg. You're going to get to see Eric here on stage for the next 45 minutes uh, to 50 minutes, but it is a team of Eric and Lauren, and a whole bunch of our key uh, library staff that really do make this observatory happen. So thank you, Lauren, if you're in the room. Are you here? You're in the very back. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> to our amazing observatory docents, thank you for all of your support and all of your help with all the programming that we're doing. To our donors, uh, we can't thank our donors enough for helping support us. And to our community partners, which you'll learn a little bit more about, thank you to those as well. Please join us tonight after the lecture for one of our observatory public exploration nights. Just outside these glass doors, we will have an opportunity to view some things through our telescopes just a few minutes after our uh, lecture gets over. Who is Eric McLaughlin? Eric is our city's first astronomer for the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. In addition to his graduate coursework in astronomy, he double majored in engineering and engineering physics. And let me tell you, that's come in handy a few times. Eric was one of 23 applicants who went, underwent a two-day interview process, day one being a traditional interview. If you would consider six interviewers traditional, six of us on one side, poor Eric on the other side. And then day two being an oral presentation. We were looking for someone that could educate and invigorate, and let me tell you, we have found our guy. If you are young or young at heart, a novice or an expert in astronomy, Eric has a unique talent to be able to speak to us all. His passion for astronomy is both evident and contagious and is a big why, reason why the observatory has become such a popular destination. Some of you may not have known this, but on March 19th, this March 19th, was Eric's fifth anniversary here at the observatory. So please congratulate Eric for passing five years. That does remind me I need to finish his evaluation. For those of you that are calculating, going back in, my, in your mind, Eric's first day was less than one week before our grand opening and dedication. Let's reflect, learn, and hopefully come up with some amazing new ideas as we welcome our city's very first city astronomer, Eric McLaughlin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, again, I can't reiterate enough all the, uh, the thanks that Aaron gave to everyone. We really couldn't do this without all the wonderful support we have from our donors, our docents, and our staff. So thank you again so much. Now. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a lot, and it's going to be hard to cover everything, so I'm going to be doing my best to paint a picture of what happened over the past five years. As we know, it's been a complicated five years in general, but let's try and look in some specific lenses. So diving right in, let's go ahead and consider how we want to look at things. We have a specific mission here at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, and we are here to provide uh, a, a inspiration for lifelong learning and to provide access to everyone for that. And so, with that in mind, well, how do we actually live out that mission over the years? That's what we're going to be uh, looking at the past five years with that kind of a lens. So, let's Try and break it down, because five years is quite a bit of time. So let's start with a nice timeline here. And we're going to jump in up here. And then uh, continuing with the uh, leg metaphor, we would be reaching our stride for a time frame there. And throwing all the metaphors out the window, yeah, we had to deal with the pand pandemic. That is something that all of us had to deal with. And we had some interesting times in that time frame as well. And likewise, we uh, have reintroduced people back into the facility. It's weird after a, quite a while to actually see people again. So I have the advantage right now, I can't see any of you. So it's like, it's like I'm still isolated. No, 
Anyway, uh, we also want to note on where we're going in the future, uh, and there's a lot we can talk about in each of these stages, so we're going to have to be uh, missing a few pieces here. Nevertheless, at five years, we can be more detailed in this time frame than we will be able to in 10 years. So this is the one opportunity we can have a really nice detailed look back at the last five years, the entire history of the observatory without having to leave a few things out. So jumping right in, when it comes to a building built by uh, public, uh, public services, well, you gotta start somewhere and generally the story starts in the bureaucracy. And so, we'll start with the California Budget Act of 2011, where you actually had some interesting things happen, including these bills, which uh, caused the dissolution of redevelopment agencies. And what does that even mean? Why do we care? Well, that meant that the successor agencies, which include uh, things like the city of Rancher Mirage, had to actually find out how to use the redevelopment bonds that were issued to it. Uh, and so, the city itself found a myriad of ways to actually utilize those funds. They did a number of intersection capacity improvements, uh, worked on the citywide bike, bike path infrastructure, uh, improved some storm drains, uh, improved uh, American Disabilities Act access around the uh, city, as well as right around here where we are, there was some improvements in this building as well, as well as some uh, improvements to the low-income housing facilities, along with a number of others. There's a lot of things that these funds went into, and yet there were still some remaining bonds. And so, well, what were they gonna do with them? And there is some thought, and then we can look at a specific uh, a tourism advisory commission meeting in 2013 that happened to be rather pivotal. When that meeting was going on, uh, Dana Hobart, the one of our council, former council members, asked, what type of exciting project would you like to see in Rancho Mirage? That was uh, addressed to the, the uh, uh, committee and the, anyone who was in attendance, and it wasn't right at that moment that he got a response. It was after everything had, uh, had really started to, to die down and the city councilors leaving the chambers when from back in the uh, uh, back of the room, Marilyn Bauer uh, happened to suggest, how about an observatory? Just in passing, and that planted a seed, a seed that actually uh, made its way through the processes to actually start research on, huh, could that actually work out? And yeah, it started to uh, uh, turn out that, yeah, that could work out. Why were they actually able to figure it out? Well, they looked at the right places. As the crow flies, there's a really great observatory not all that far from here. Palomar Observatory is relatively close by. If you try and drive there, it's gonna be a little bit bigger of a journey because you have to drive all the way around that mountain, but in any case, it's nearby, and so it's a great place to look for resources. And what was found was the superintendent, Dan McKenna. Dan McKenna is an incredibly knowledgeable man. He is uh, a wonderful person who uh, was not just wonderful for his knowledge, but because he actually volunteered quite a bit of his time and expertise to actually evaluate uh, not just this site, but other sites in the valley and to actually determine whether or not it would make sense to build a public outreach and education observatory here, as well as providing other insight onto what, uh, what kinds of equipment and who to actually partner with and so on and so forth. He was actually a uh, very pivotal person to have made contact with. And uh, when it comes to uh, knowing how observatories work, yeah, their directors of them are great. It's the superintendents that actually are the ones that actually set up all the equipment, make sure it all keeps working and so on. So yeah, he was a perfect person to be talking to. Okay, so with that set up, the initial budget for the uh, observatory was set at 1.7 million, and a number of companies were contracted with, including Sea West Enterprise, who likes to work with uh, observatory systems as well. Uh, we actually had a wonderful architect, Charlie Martin, worked on this facility, and if we actually look here, he's over on the far right there. That is Charlie Martin right there. And uh, this actually was the last, prog or, well, the last project he actually designed. He designed a number of wonderful facilities, uh, including as, uh, uh, as unfortunately he did pass away in 2020 in his obituary, it actually noted that he liked to make things that uh, turn people's eyes towards the heavens. He actually designed a number of churches, and again, his final project was our uh, observatory. 
And uh, in the end, we actually broke ground on that facility on December 7th, 2016. And what's fun is we actually kept an eye on that whole progress. Now, as Charlie Martin uh, designed the facility, he had a number of interesting choices to make. And when he actually uh, uh, drew it out, he actually uh, thought it looked a bit like a comet, with the main dome being the main coma of the comet near the nucleus, and the main sweeping deck being the tail of the comet. He had a few other interesting decisions to make. Uh, he employed Cortan steel on a number of the surfaces, which does get a bit of a rusty color, but that rusty color wasn't meant to look shabby. It doesn't at all. In fact, it matches the library quite well because of the uh, copper we have in a number of places. It ends up matching the facility incredibly well. And among the other decisions were what kind of wood to use. On the deck, there is Ipe wood, which is a very dense and durable kind of wood that actually is more dense than water. You put a chunk of it in water, it will actually sink. Uh, but so many different things went into the overall thought process for this facility. And it was around this stage here when I actually showed up. Again, one week before we were actually opening. It's always fun to note all the cute little plants all around. Those uh, look so nice and small, yeah. It's always weird to go back out and see them all be nice and big now. But yeah, this was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful, wonderfully designed facility that has worked out so incredibly well. You can't see it much here, but again, those notes that those bonds were used for, things like ADA compliance improvements throughout the city, yeah, well, this facility here was built with those in mind. I always like to point out that we could have had a nice grandiose staircase over here, but not everyone can make it upstairs. And that's why we have that great winding pathway up there, and likewise, a pathway up to the dome itself. It is a wonderfully designed facility. Now, okay, so it was done, then what? Well we actually had to open it. And so the observatory dedication did occur on the 25th of uh, March on 2018. So again, just over uh, five years ago from now. But uh, when that dedication happened, we were expecting maybe like 400 people. Yeah, 1,000 people showed up. It was uh, far busier than we expected and it was uh, quite complicated to try and handle it. Uh, we should have taken this as more of a sign than uh, we did. We ta did take it as an indication that people are very interested, but we should have taken it as we would be having trouble handling how interested people were in this facility. Uh, more on that later. But in any case, yeah, it was a phenomenal event having everyone here, and we had a variety of uh, people talking at this event. We had then Mayor Townsend and Council Member Hobart also uh, gave talks at that point. Uh, the library director, uh, David Bryant, also gave a talk. We also had Dan McKenna come by to talk a bit about his work here as well. We even had Rick Armstrong, Neil Armstrong's son, gave a uh, talk at that point. And we had a few other people speak, and the least important of which was me. Uh, and I have a couple of notes on uh, what we uh, uh, actually were talking about there. When I gave my talk, there were some things I wanted to highlight, and one of the things I wanted to highlight is how this facility could actually make a big difference for, well, how people might actually explore the heavens. And so I wanted to note just how so many telescopes, well, they don't end up getting used, the personally owned ones. Uh, I said that, well, the vast majority of personal telescopes often live out much of their existence as ornaments of our preferred storage space. And it was one of those things that's really worth highlighting is that we want to be here not just as the place you go. We are here, again, to inspire that, uh, that desire to actually go out and explore yourself. And so uh, I concluded my talk by saying this. Through the... Through the use of this new observatory, I fully expect to see many people whose burgeoning interest in astronomy, in astronomy will lead to a lifelong interest in all branches of science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as a love for all means of expressing the wonder they have experienced. Indeed, I look forward to seeing now skilled individuals packing away their personal telescopes with an excitement about the prospect of their many future uses. That is really something I want to see. I want to see people 
coming here, seeing some things through our telescopes, and then wanting to go and explore more. They can, of course, come back. We're happy to have you guys come back. But we want you guys to actually have an innate desire for more exploration. And so it's a really worthwhile thing to have as a starting point. But where do we go from there? There's so many different ways we could actually take the whole facility. And when it came time to uh, actually publish the, uh, the program guide for that first quarter, well, this was the centerfold. It's a great thing on the observatory. Uh, they were able to get my picture because they knew I was coming, but we didn't actually get a chance to n hammer down anything other than a number of dates here. That's why it's nice and generically labeled observing our universe for a bit there. Now, those were all about two weeks apart, and uh, when it came down to it, I gave a lot of talks. Uh, I gave a talk on just about every single one of those dates. But what you'll also note there is those are the observing our universe time frame. Those are the talks. Where's the stargazing? Well, uh, the, on the footnote down here, it notes one day a month for stargazing. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was cute. It was a cute thought on how we would actually be operating. So how do we actually operate? Well, we knew we wouldn't get everything right the first, first year through because, well, we couldn't. But we could jump in and try and do as much as possible. And so when it comes down to uh, how you should think about working in a cyclic environment, like working in a place like, like Rancher Mirage here in the valley that has a very seasonal uh, way of living. We have our season where everyone's here. We have the hot season where nobody wants to be here at all. Uh, but uh, in that particular way of thinking, it's useful to actually treat it a bit like teaching a class. And when you teach a class, the first time through is always the hardest because you have to make the curriculum. You have to try a whole bunch of things. The second time through, you say, okay, these things worked. These things didn't. Let's change it. And then you start on your way to iteratively improving. So that first time through is very difficult. And so what do we do? We tried a whole bunch of things and we saw what would stick. We had, like I mentioned, I gave a lot of presentations in those first few months. Uh, as I was coming from actually teaching uh, an astronomy class, actually concurrently with when I actually started, that was complicated, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, I was used to giving a lot of presentations, so it actually worked out pretty well, and we had some stargazing. Uh, we quickly found that some stargazing was not enough, and what that actually meant was, well, that first stargazing that we had, it was uh, set up with a registration, and then we had this pattern for a very long while. You have a registration, you can only fit about 40 people in the facility, so you have a registration for about 40 people. How does that actually work out? Well, the first time we did it, registration filled up within an hour and a half. That seems like an incredibly long time when you compare it to how quickly they filled up later on. And so uh, that one day filled up in what we thought was quite quick. And so we knew we needed to have more. So within a couple of months, by May, we had two weeks worth of uh, nights open, which corresponded to when the moon was not very bright. But anyway, more on that in a bit. Other things we tried, we did actually try showing some science fiction films in here. We've had film programs in this room quite a bit, and so figure, hey, we've got a, uh, I'm here, I can actually talk the science of different things, so why not actually talk some science in the background of these films? Was it popular? Eh, not really, so it didn't stick, so that's why we don't do it anymore. We tried a whole bunch of things, and when you try a whole bunch of things, you learn a lot. We did learn a lot, and well, we found that, uh, well, we found a lot of things that we'll go into. In any case, other things we also did is we applied for a grant from the Anderson's Children Foundation, uh, and that grant created the Connecting Children to the Stars uh, program, which actually used a good chunk of funds there, about $10,000 of which uh, was set aside for, uh, for covering the transportation costs for uh, students from uh, our target age is fifth grade, but at the same time, we were happy to bring any students to the facility that want uh, to come. And so by bringing those classes here, we've been able to show a lot of students a lot of interesting things, and a number of those students have gone on to get library cards, come back here repeatedly, or otherwise encourage their parents to come here on stargazing nights as well. And so we have a lot of fun with that. As Aaron mentioned, we've had over uh, 2,500 students through the facility 
through that program. Now, likewise, that program, though, it has some extra things. Uh, we are using a number of the, uh, uh, the funds that we were given uh, with our integrated space theater, uh, which I'll talk about more later. Now, okay, so that was one of the things we were working on early on, and we did get that grant early on, and so it was in the fall of 2018 that we actually started uh, that program, and it started actually growing quite rapidly. Other things we also did in that time frame, again, those first few months that we were here, well, we've got a telescope. We want to take pictures of the sky, and when it comes to stargazing, it's really helpful to have a catalog of images that you can show people. And so we started taking pictures of clusters uh, like these. These are a number of uh, open and globular clusters. This is one of our favorites here. Uh, if you're hanging out tonight, you're going to get a chance to see this one. This is known as the shopping cart cluster. You might be able to see it right there. It's also known as the 37 cluster, where you actually have a nice flat top three and a sort of bent seven. But uh, always fun to note, if you do see that in the telescopes tonight, note it's going to be mirrored. So don't look for the 37, uh, look for a backwards 37. Anyway, we also take pictures of galaxies in this time frame. We got a black eye galaxy. Uh, that one is one we want to look at tonight as well. That is the Orion Nebula. And this is the Trifid Nebula. These are all wonderful things to see. And we had a good amount of time frame, in, or rather, we didn't really have that much time to be taking these images, but we needed these images to actually build up our catalog of what we want to show people. Uh, and again, when we actually took these images, you can go out and say, oh, when I look at stuff on, uh, online, I can see people taking really, really nice pictures. These don't seem all that nice in comparison. Well, you have to think about what the image is being used for. When we take images, in general, we want to actually get something that's going to be closer to what you're going to see. Sometimes we'll go for the prettier images like we have with the Trifid Nebula, but if you look through the telescope at the Orion Nebula, it's not gonna look all that different than what we actually show you. And so why then don't we have color images? Well, that has to do with the way our eyes work. Our eyes, when you're looking through those telescopes, you're gonna be mostly using the uh, cells in your eyes that don't detect color. So we don't need to get the color images and we don't want to give the impression that you're going to see color necessarily. And so in case you were wondering all that, I wanna let you know. But we are hoping to actually get a lot more, have a lot more fun getting the pretty images here soon. Anyway, more on that later. Now, okay, so here we are getting our space legs. Well, with all that stuff I've mentioned, it would be a lot if I was the only person doing it. And uh, while the staff here can help with quite a bit and do help quite a lot, uh, we also needed more help than even myself or the staff could actually handle. And that's why we started our docent programs. And in fact, in some sense, the docent program actually started before I even got here uh, as one of my uh, uh, interviewers was on the then forming uh, Observatory Advisory Commission who would be one of our docents as well. Uh, and so we actually had docents from before I even got here. Uh, but our docent program has proven incredibly invaluable. And as I mentioned, and uh, Aaron mentioned as well, we cannot thank our docents enough. Every single program we run is, in, is made possible by the help of our docents. And so, yeah, they've done so much for us. And the program grew quite quickly at the beginning. Uh, and uh, then we've had people come and go over time. It's been a, uh, quite a journey with everyone, as I am sure uh, some of our longest standing docents who are w here with us tonight uh, can attest. It's been quite an interesting and fun and winding journey at times. Now, OK. In that same time frame early on, we also had some immediate equipment additions. Uh, we had a uh, donation of an 11-inch telescope by Bob Corson. Uh, Bob Corson uh, was actually one of our docents. He actually uh, realized he was having trouble getting the uh, telescope set up and wanted it to go somewhere uh, good, and he gave it to us, for which we were incredibly honored. And this was a nice telescope that actually proved to us some interesting things. Uh, when the observatory was envisioned, those four pads that were put out there, it was thought that we'd have uh, amateur astronomers coming all the time wanting to use the facility and set up their telescope and such. And it turned out with our stargazing and such, uh, there was relatively little interest in doing that. So with trying to have consistent stargazing, we actually found it uh, better to not really continue to advertise, hey, bring your own telescope. We actually 
realized if we had our own complement of telescopes, we could do a lot more. And thus, we acquired three more nine and a quarter inch telescopes, uh, which are actually probably currently being set up on the deck as we speak. Uh, but they are wonderful instruments that give us a wide variety of things to view. Along the same lines, we also got a Lunt Solar Telescope. It's an H-alpha telescope. Uh, that, pro program, or that project, getting that telescope, actually started before my official hire date uh, with some meetings I had with David Bryant and Aaron Espinoza, our current director. Uh, and so we started that project. It was in uh, mid-2018, mid to uh, late 2018, where we actually got that program working and, get it, and got that uh, telescope set up initially. It's a wonderful telescope that provides beautiful images of the sun. And this is actually what sunset looks like if you look through that telescope, which you can do safely because over 99% of the light from the sun is filtered out when you're looking through that telescope. But as I mentioned it, it's an H-alpha telescope, which means it filters out everything except a very specific wavelength of red light. Now, while that's going there, you might have noticed that you didn't see much detail on the sun. And we'll come back to that in a bit. But it is a very valuable thing to actually have a good working telescope to look at the sun safely. And so we uh, have that set up generally on our, uh, or during the day, of course, for our daytime tours. You get to look through that. But we have other plans for that. Hopefully we'll get to that later. But OK, so all these things going on you might have uh, gotten the impression that it was a busy, hectic, and stressful time. Uh, it was. Yeah, there was a lot going on there. I couldn't keep up with it. Our docents couldn't keep up with it. Our staff couldn't keep up with it in uh, that configuration. We needed more specialized help. And so that's why we actually adjusted a few things. I actually started doing a bit fewer lectures because a uh, lecture every two weeks was quite a bit, especially when it came time to be in the middle of stargazing. So. Yeah, we uh, uh, adjusted how that would go, and we did more stargazing. And we also had a couple of people join us. Uh, we've already uh, met Lauren back there. Thank you again. Uh, she might actually have gone back out to the observatory to, again, continue to prep for tonight. But we also had uh, Annie. Uh, she reached out to us. She wanted to see if we were open for a... Uh, an internship, and Annie Poy, she was a phenomenal intern. She uh, did so much for us, and she learned a lot about where she wanted to go by actually uh, spending her time here. She might even be watching this on uh, uh, YouTube right now, so hi, Annie. It's great to have had you, and hope you're doing really well on your continuing education. Uh, she is currently working towards a, her master's in education uh, over in, I believe it's uh, Penn State. Uh, but yeah, she is a great person. She did wonderful things for us. And uh, you'll notice what's going on in that picture. We'll get to that in a minute. But shortly after Annie started here, Lauren also started as our observatory coordinator. She took care of a lot of things that I couldn't, but we couldn't just ask someone else to work on if it wasn't someone who was working directly with me. And so Lauren helps so much here. You might see me more, but she does so much in the background. And yeah, you do get to see her even up front every once in a while too. So again, if you see her, thank her for everything she's been able to do here. It's been, uh, it would be a, a impossible journey without her here. And again, without the help of uh, Annie in that summer, some things wouldn't have happened. Uh, most notably, what made that postcard there, that little photo booth picture. Yeah, we had quite an event that summer of 2019. It was the Apollo 11's 50th anniversary of landing. And we coordinated a big thing. And this wasn't something that was just coordinated uh, with the observatory staff. This encompassed a good chunk of the whole library. It's one of the biggest events we've had uh, through the observatory. Again, it's one that encompassed the entirety of the library's operations that day. And so we had a variety of activities there, uh, including virtual and aug augmented reality tours, which we, uh, as a team, had to fully develop and uh, figure out how to do. We had a number of science demonstrations, including uh, being able to feel what it would be like to pick up a book, well, here on the Earth, okay, that's normal. Pick up the same book on the moon and actually feel how different that would be. It's one of my favorite demos. 
breaks too easy, but we're working on that. Uh, but we also had a number of 3D prints, including one you probably saw at the back of the room. That life-size 3D print of one of Buzz Aldrin's footprints is something that uh, took a lot of effort to actually get made, but it is something that is, well, tangible. Actually going off of the actual images that Buzz Aldrin took of his footprint and actually building a 3D, 3D representation of it it's something that can actually put you there, and we're really happy that we put in the effort to have that at that time, but especially as we get to use it very frequently. Now, one of the most fun things, though, with this particular event was our precisely timed video. Uh, we had a nice little uh, brief snippet of video that included a, all the uh, mission audio and an animation showing, uh, and, and some uh, mission video showing when the Apollo 11 lander went down and landed on the surface of the moon. And it was precisely timed so that touchdown in that video, as we played it, occurred exactly at the 50th anniversary mark. And so we're really happy with that. It's one of those nice little things where you could literally nail down the moment that it was 50 years since we first set foot or first landed on the moon. So I'm really happy with how that all worked out. It was an amazing event. I hope we can have some similar event to that. And uh, you might find it a little weird that the uh, image we're showing here, yeah, it's of this room, uh, so it's just a little mirrored weird. Anyway, as we were going in that time frame, though, there were some things we noted. When talking about those stargazing events as we first did them, yeah, we had our uh, set of closed events where it was registration only, 40 people at a time, going for a two-week stint, uh, two to one week stint, depending on exactly how it was all working out. We had to avoid the moon. It was uh, complicated and it shifted and it made it very hard to tell people when they needed to register and when all this stuff was going on. And there were plenty of people who were upset and we were rather upset with having to coordinate it all. And so we wanted to actually start to find a way to uh, quell some of those concerns and give people at least uh, another experience into the observatory. And this experience turned out to be something that was a lot better than we first uh, thought it was in comparison to the normal stargazing events. And that was our Swoon at the Moon program. Swoon at the Moon was set up in, an, uh, in a way that it would work out every month at the moon being near its first quarter phase. It was the best time to look at it, so we always aim for that time frame. Uh, and it was a open event, so there was no registration. And since we were only looking at the moon, we actually were able to nudge those events a little bit earlier in the night, which meant we had more accessibility to uh, families and such and anyone who didn't want to be uh, out incredibly late. So that was great. We still saw more public interest than we could really keep up with those events. Uh, sometimes uh, people would just be a little frustrated on how the line worked there. And so we've worked on improving even just what waiting in a line means. More on that later. Now, okay, other things that happened in that same time frame. We actually were reached out to by uh, uh, Dr. Peter Jeniskins of the SETI Institute and the Ames Research Center. And he came with an opportunity and it was to install this little thing over here. This is a camera, an all-sky camera that looks at the entire sky, and it is part of the Global Fireball Observatory network of cameras that looks for big, bright meteors and is able to, when viewed, viewing those meteors from multiple sites, you can actually calculate the trajectories of those meteors, and this is the part that's really exciting, and we're waiting for that meteor. We're waiting for that good meteor that's going to put something down on the ground, so that way he can say, hey, Eric, there's gonna be some meteorites over in this area. Tell your people to go there. And that is something that we are really glad that we're in this partnership with uh, Dr. Jeniskins because yeah, he's actually going to be able to tell us when there's something on the ground to go look for it. Uh, we could actually literally send out an e-blast and say, hey, a meteor fell over here. Go have fun looking for it. So yeah, it's a uh, great little public outreach thing that uh, we're happy to be a part of because again, public outreach, but if you go find that meteorite, you want to make sure you actually get it certified as a meteorite, which means you should send it to someone like him, which means he gets his research. So it's a win-win uh, situation. All right, so one of the things we get, as you saw in, oh, in uh, sorry, this image here, we first set it up right on one of those pads on the deck. Those pads can have ethernet connections on them, and so we actually connected it directly to the internet 
through that for a time. And so this was when the first, the night of the first detection uh, with that particular instrument. And you can actually see the detection is that little streamy thing there. But all the other lines include a few things. The ones that aren't nice and concentric are aircraft, but all those concentric lines are nice star streaks going across there. It ends up looking quite wonderful there. And this is actually what a, uh, a view from that particular spot looked like during stargazing. Everybody rushed around and zipped around. I always like noting the slow movement of the telescope that this was positioned under. You can see it slowly moving through the course of this particular event. And while it turns out that this uh, worked out really neat for these kinds of videos, it was a suboptimal place for the uh, camera itself. And so it got moved uh, shortly thereafter. You've, you want to find it, look for a shiny silvery box mounted to one of those uh, six tall concrete pillars. Along the same time frame, a few other upgrades came, including uh, noting that, well, the nice deep space camera that you saw those pictures from earlier, well, that's great for taking pictures of deep space dim objects, but if we want to take pictures of planets or the moon, well, we need different kinds of cameras, and that is why we had the Perseus port installed, the thing shown right over here. It is the thing at the center. It is a uh, basically a mirror on a dial that allows you to select a variety of, or a set of uh, cameras on there. So now we have three cameras on there with room for a fourth if it ever needs to be used. And so, okay, that's great, and it worked out well. But in the same time frame, one of our docents came with an interesting idea. He actually came with it when he applied to be a docent, but he didn't just come with an idea on something neat. He came with a skill set and connections on how to actually make it happen. He wanted to actually change the, uh, or rather give an opportunity to transform the inside of the observatory into a bit of a planetarium, and that is where we ended up with integrating that inside to the dome, and thus we call it the Integrated Space Theater. And that installation occurred uh, in late October 2019, and boy is that thing a lot of fun to use. Uh, it works out quite well, especially when we have those cloudy nights, but we have some other interesting opportunities in how we can use it, including if we actually utilize what we have with the Perseus port and take the video from the uh, telescope and pump it, pump it into the projector, well, things like looking at the moon can have interesting effects on the dome there. And so uh, we have... We used to do that in our Swoon at the Moon setup. We actually find now that eh, it's maybe a little bit better for people to look at it with their own eyes, but uh, in any case, we had a lot of fun with that, and we likely will use, utilize that same system again in the future. Finally, in 2019, we had our first live stream. This was a great event. It was the transit of Mercury, and you may not see it there. There's, there's a tiny little dot on the sun there. That is the planet Mercury passing in front of the sun. And this really showed that all our work with the solar telescope throughout the past uh, year and a half turned out to uh, pay off. But in this particular live stream, we were especially careful. Uh, we didn't uh, have live chat in there. We were look ch keeping an eye on Griffith Observatory's live stream, and they had all sorts of conspiracy nonsense going in there. So we thought, yeah, we we made a good call there. And we also didn't put any music in there, which was uh, uh, because we didn't want to deal with any copyright issues and having our account locked. We actually had some issues with that around that time frame. Uh, and uh, yeah. When you look at the length of this particular presentation being, or this live stream being uh, two and a half hours, Lauren and I interjecting every once in a while, eh, it was okay, but it was maybe not the most exciting live stream. Uh, yeah, so it goes. But nevertheless, this turned out to be a very important practice. More on that in a minute. Yeah, so, okay, with all these things that we had going on, it was worth noting that we still couldn't get to everything. We had other systems improvements we needed, we had projects we wanted to work on, other things going on. With all this stuff, there was just not enough time to get everything done because, well, our job here is to actually be bringing you in, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing, and when there's a lot of demand, it makes it hard to actually make sure everything in the background is moving forward. But yeah, there's just not enough time to do absolutely everything. 
then the pandemic happened. Uh, and yeah, while most people uh, had a incredibly uh, hard time with this shift into a more closed off environment, uh, isolating and everything, and I understand uh, exactly why all that was. It was hard to be so isolated for so long. Now, when we first closed down here, the word from City Hall was, all right, we need to close the city down, and we're going to do so for at least two weeks. Two weeks was the plan. Two weeks is what we were given. Nevertheless, uh, or rather, my perspective in that particular moment is, okay, if this is actually over in two weeks, I need to do stuff. And this is where it actually felt a little bit of being like something from a Twilight Zone episode where uh, all those projects that I didn't have time for because I was doing, you know, the important part of my job, the, the actual improving of things that is also important but is secondary that I couldn't get to, uh, well, there was time now. Time, time, time. Time enough at last. Yes, it really felt a bit like a Twilight Zone episode. Thankfully, I didn't break my glasses, though. Yeah, it was a... A uh, really interesting time frame. Uh, again, while it was isolating at the same time, I'm used to being alone in the observatory, so I actually got to just sit down and not be interrupted. So yeah, it was, it was actually good for getting stuff done. And one really important thing I got done was our uh, solar telescopes imaging program. It is something I wrote from scratch in Python, and it resulted in images like the one on the right there. What this does is it actually crops centers and uh, rotates images of the sun to ensure that the north pole of the sun is actually uh, oriented at the top of the image, and the uh, pseudo color was added there to pull out more detail. You might even compare this image to that sunset you saw earlier. Yeah, it should be obvious just how much more detail you're seeing here. Now, this also automatically guides the telescope to uh, that particular spot there, so it stays on the sun throughout the day, works wonderfully. I'm really glad I actually got to get this thing built uh, and working. It is a great tool that we use every day when we can set up the solar telescope. Now, in the meantime, we also started live streaming. Again, that first live stream was really useful, and we actually jumped on this opportunity as quickly as possible with our first Swoon at the Moon live stream being April 1st, when we actually closed the city down on March 9th. So less than a month later, we had our first live stream with uh, over 1,000 people viewing that particular live stream, and we held live streams throughout that year for every possible opportunity for the different phases of the moon, because normally, Swoon at the Moon is always that first quarter phase. We got to have a little bit more fun, because I could come in at any time. Now, our most successful live stream, however, was the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which came uh, late 2020, and we had 30,000 people see that video. It is something that uh, astounds me to this day, and everything we learned with doing that live streaming, we still use on special occasions, like we did uh, back in December for the lunar occultation of Mars, when the moon passed in front of Mars. Something that's kind of hard to have 100 people look through a telescope for one particular minute, so it worked out really well to have that. But back to the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, this is one of the images we actually got with the telescope. This is not two separate images. They're all right here together. You can see Saturn's moon Titan is that little speck right up there. Yeah, uh, this was a great uh, example of what you could actually do with a live stream event, more so than uh, you could do with necessarily having everyone try and funnel through the facility in a very short amount of time. Okay, so... We made a lot of progress along the way. Also, we had Annie, our Annie Poy, our intern. She came back virtually. Uh, she worked with programming a lot of things for us because while I was working on the uh, solar imaging program, she was working on a lot of our weather data and made plots like this one where you actually have uh, an entire year's worth of data here, seeing the mac uh, maximum temperature in a day compared to the lowest temperature in a day, and you could actually see that whole fluctuation across the entire year and just see just how warm it got uh, in the summer and compared to the uh, relatively mm, nice and calm temperatures in the winter we get here. 
Likewise, we have these plots which are colorized based to show uh, what temperature it was in a specific hour of every single hour of a month. And you can see the peak of heat during the day and when a storm arrives and so on, throws everything off, all sorts of interesting things. And I really love this plot. This plot, it compares temperature to humidity and shows just how uh, having a consistent water vapor, uh, amount of water in the air actually causes this to move in interesting fluctuations. But yeah, uh, I could go on and on about that plot. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but if you want to learn about those plots, well, you should check out the results of our overly ambitious plans that we made in that time frame. Because it wasn't enough for me to work on things, for, for all of us to work on things. We actually wanted to get a variety of things uh, to all of you at that time frame. We, of course, as I mentioned, did our Swoon at the Moon live streams. We also uh, started stargazing primers because we would like you to be here for stargazing. But if you can't, maybe we could actually just give you some information. Those turned out to not be as popular, and they took a lot of work to make. So we didn't keep making those for very long. But our Systems Are Go videos they lasted the longest. Those videos showed the output of our weather station, those plots. Every month we made new ones. We showed the output from our all-sky camera that uh, kept an eye on the night throughout the night. And we also showed uh, videos of our, from our solar telescope. This particular one is a great one. Uh, it is a big, uh, fl uh, big prominence, that, uh, or filament in this case. And that is a bunch of material floating over the sun. And each frame there is a minute. So this is taking the place over maybe two hours. That filament, again, is the size of the planet Jupiter in diameter. That is what we're looking at here in the course of a couple hours. So we got to highlight some really neat phenomena that were happening right around the planet uh, in that particular program. And we did so to wonderfully calm and uh, relaxing music. So if you're having trouble falling asleep, look up one of the old uh, Systems Are Go videos. I've done it if I was, uh, when I've had trouble sleeping. Great music. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, pipe choir is great. Anyway. Uh, then our last set of videos we were making there is our distancing with the stars videos. And we got to do a lot of fun things with that. Here is actually how one of those videos closes. Indeed, we sit as an infant lying in their cradle, a hand just reaching beyond the bars, still yet to fully grasp the knowledge of the home we will one day inhabit. This is the end credits where I got to have a lot of fun, but this particular program we used here is Space Engine. We use it all the time in the projection system whenever we have, uh, have cloudy nights. We get to have fun using this again. And when I can go and explore the universe with you and give you a great presentation, this one in particular is looking at extrasolar planets. It's one of my favorite things I've ever put together. I highly recommend checking it out, but again, we got to have a lot of fun in this time frame, even though it was overly ambitious and we tried to do way too much. And so, we needed to actually also be organized. It was in this time frame that uh, Lauren found Airtable. It's a great thing that helped us organize everything. Uh, it allows us to have things like the uh, image on the right. You're going to see something, actually, probably that exact thing up in the observatory. That is an output of Airtable. It allows us to organize them in a wonderful way and make displays easily. Our documents and other things are put in there as well as our maintenance schedules. And this has even been employed for the Writers' Festival, so you can thank Lauren for that being more organized than it ever has been. So it's a great program there. I'm gonna hurry right along through here. In the same time frame, we also needed to do some uh, hardware uh, repairs. We had a problem with the deep space camera and had that repaired, I actually uh, corrected some issues with the lighting control that if you were in any stargazing before the pandemic, you might have uh, had to deal with little plates taped to the, uh, the lighting inside the dome that might fall down. Yeah, I fixed that. Uh, audio system upgrades, we actually, with the IST installed in there, we were able to actually put some audio in there. So if we need amplification, we have that. And also the solar telescope got its own mount among other things in that same time frame. And then, towards the end of the uh, uh, pandemic, something interesting happened. Uh, but the interesting thing happened well after I found something. In 2018, I found what is called the Library Telescope Program. It is an interesting program about uh, checking telescopes out just like books. At the time, we couldn't make it happen. Again, with everything I had already talked about uh, going on in 
2018, yeah, there was no way I was going to be able to actually uh, work on that particular program. And we also didn't have the funding or the bandwidth to actually, you know, do it correctly. Shortly after Lauren started, she independently found it as well. And it's been sitting in our minds as a good thing to do, but we just didn't have the funding and the, uh, the timing to actually make it happen. Fast forward until uh, Gary Smaby. Gary Smaby of the Smaby Foundation, he was interested in uh, funding a risky project. One where, yeah, you might not be able to, uh, you might expect to lose money. Uh, he's a uh, really great guy and he uh, came to us with that notion and we knew just the thing to propose. It was the Library Telescope Program. And he actually, uh, funded the entirety of it. We have one of those telescopes at the back of the room, and they are great little things, but as we were starting to consider bringing people back into the facility, we were able to work on this uh, quite readily, and this, uh, this grant that he gave us allowed us to actually purchase 30 of these telescopes, and we had docents and staff come in here in this very room again, and work on this as a bit of an assembly line. As Aaron mentioned, my experience working in, as an engineer uh, actually turned out quite useful. In this case, it, my time as a manufacturing engineer was quite useful because we did actually make it a bit of an assembly line. And boy, did that actually work out well to get that done in a very short amount of time. When we were talking about actually uh, starting this program, it was late 2021. By April, the program launched. So we are heading towards the first anniversary of that program within the next few weeks. So it has been phenomenal. Again, over 500 checkouts of those telescopes so far. All right, so likewise, as I mentioned, coming into 2022, we brought stargazing back. And we started slow. We reduced the numbers because we didn't want to create an unsafe environment. And we actually utilized mandatory safety covers. Uh, you, if you've been here at all for any of our uh, stargazing or open nights, we've still got those safety covers. They are little hygienic things to put on the eyepiece. And it's really worth noting that, yeah, during the pandemic, we want to make sure everyone is nice and safe. Now, it's just in general, if you just want that, yeah, we want to make sure you can have it, so it's good. Now, again, likewise, demand immediately outpaced our availability when we did that, and so we slowly ramped up, but it could never be enough. That is what we realized, and that is why we developed our open format, uh, and that is our observatory public exploration nights, or open nights, as we like to say it. It's not a weird thing if you say it really fast and don't have a gap between open and nights. It's open nights, yeah. All right. And so what we did is we actually utilized what we learned from doing Swoon at the Moon, and we actually uh, made it a little bit nicer to be in the line. I hang out down at the bottom, or one of our docents, or, or, or Lauren does. Uh, it works out really well to uh, have a good time there. We also have a consistent uh, year-round availability, month round as well. We don't work off of the phases of the moon like we used to. It's just every Thursday and every Saturday with some exceptions that do come up, uh, but in general, we're nice and available, which works out really well for making sure people can get here. And since it works around those space limitations uh, that the old stargazing format couldn't, we have no registration, so everyone can come when they come just in that time frame, and they have been exceedingly popular, with our most popular night having 300 people come in one night. That was the uh, Saturday of President's Day weekend. It was uh, quite hectic. But yeah, it was a lot of fun nonetheless. Okay, one important thing to note though is when we were going through this, we needed to set aside time. That is something we realized. We don't want to end up in another uh, Twilight Zone situation where I just need time to actually do things. So we actually set aside time last year. In that case, it was for August, and we did a lot of equipment repair, improvements, cleaning and calibration, and a variety of other things. Then uh, something else happened. There, you might notice that, yeah, it's August. It's the hot time frame. We had a number of uh, power outages, and the city actually intentionally shut some things down at times. Unfortunately, that also led to a bit of a damaged hard drive for the Integrated Space Theater's computer. And so after the initial repair, there was a lot to actually do for setting that system back up, and it took a lot of time, but eventually there was some progress like that. That, that doesn't quite look right, and it shouldn't. It's, uh, Saturn looks okay, but the rest of the thing, yeah, it was messed up for quite a while, and it took a long time to actually figure that out. But at this point, 
we learned a lot, and uh, uh, Bruce Fiegel, again, the one who actually came up with this system and uh, got it installed and helped me relearn this, he has uh, noted that I'm probably the, uh, the expert in this particular company's uh, system on the West Coast. So, uh, yeah, we learned a lot there. We're ready to, to move forward even if things go wrong again. All right, so, okay, that was a lot that happened in the last time frame there. But it's worth noting that along the way and throughout that entire time frame, we've had a number of different collaborations. From JPL, we've actually had Dr. Kelly Fast. She is uh, in the Planetary Defense Division, which is an awesome name for a division, uh, but she actually works with asteroids and uh, other small bodies in the solar system that could potentially be a threat to the Earth. She is a wonderful person. She's actually given a couple of talks here. We've also had Dr. Mike Ressler be here a couple of times, uh, once virtually and once in person. He is with the James Webb Space Telescope, and he has been with that program from the beginning for decades at this point. Uh, likewise, we've had Mark Pine from the Griffith Observatory give a talk here, as well as be on the podcast that our uh, program coordinator, uh, TJ, set up. He uh, uh, got him on that particular uh, program, and it is a wonderful program. Highly recommend checking that out. We've also had some collaborations with the National Parks. David Larson from uh, Joshua Tree came out talking about light pollution here not long ago, and most of those talks you can actually find, again, on our YouTube page if uh, you want to hear if I am not uh, taking too much of your thought here tonight. You can learn a lot. And there were also a variety of other special groups out there. As Aaron mentioned, a number of them, like Sunnylands and the Ritz-Carlton uh, and the Bachelorette and so on. We also had uh, uh, the TED team from TED Talks. They were doing a TED Women event over in La Quinta, and they actually brought a group out here that we were able to uh, uh, do a lot with. And again... In general, we've had a lot of people come through this facility. And so it's worth noting that we want to make sure we are planning for the future. And we are working on a new program here, a uh, new IST program, Integrated Space Theater Dome Projection Program. This one is uh, partly funded through the Anderson Children's Foundation. I told you I'd get back there eventually. And it is worth noting what that is. That is meant for that Connecting Children to the Stars program. It is one to be specially for when kids come here. And uh, uh, Bruce Fiegel, again, he is the one making that program. He didn't just help us get it all installed. He actually has the video editing experience, not just editing, but filmmaking experience, and he is working on that right now. And we're so excited as it is almost done. We've seen some uh, demonstrations of it. It is a great program. I'm really excited for the uh, grand opening of that. Now, as mentioned, with uh, last, last year we took time in August, we are going to continue to do that, uh, to take time to train our docents, to make upgrades, and so on. Uh, and as mentioned, yeah, we don't want to need another disaster to have sufficient time frame to actually do the maintenance. Now, going back to my dedication talk, I talked about people using their telescopes using their own telescopes and often just leaving them in a room. Well, we want people to actually utilize their telescopes, and we've had a number of people come to us specifically asking if we can help them learn how to use their telescopes. We have not had the bandwidth for that, but we want to try. And so we're working on a way to try and make a telescope workshop uh, that will allow you to bring your telescope in, and myself and our docents will help you learn how to use your telescope so you can be better equipped to take that back out and explore the universe with. It is, again, one large, unfulfilled section of that dedication speech. Uh, and so we're really excited for that to be coming up here soon more information to come, and as, and as Aaron mentioned, we have a variety of other ways that we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the observatory. Some uh, people I would love to name drop, but as we're still working out the details, I will refrain. So you just have to wait in suspense. Anyway, as we've been talking here, we've been going on quite a winding road these past five years, but everything we've done has been to try and actually find new ways and uh, as meaningful ways of actually, well, inspiring that lifelong learning. Again, at this stage, that horizon, what is out and ahead, there are a lot of different ways we can still go, but we have learned so much along the way, and that is, again, part of actually uh, building out our, and living our mission. And one of the interesting things we see is that when it comes to 
inspiring lifelong learning, we've actually also been an inspiration for other facilities. We've been reached out to by no, by no fewer than three other facilities that are using ours as a model to build their own. We don't see that as competition. That is actually, again, the ultimate outcome of living out our mission because by inspiring other facilities to do likewise, they will be inspiring lifelong learning along the way based on our model here. And so, yeah, it is the mission of this library and observatory to inspire and enable everyone to pursue knowledge and learning throughout their lives. We are so excited for where we've come from along this way, and we're so excited for where we are, have yet to go, and we hope you join us along the way. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you again. And I do have some time for questions, uh, though if you are wanting to uh, hop out and look in the observatory, we are setting up out there as well. So uh, take your time however you please. But uh, at this point, I'm happy to take questions. I will note it's gonna be very difficult for me to see you. Oh, that helps a lot. All right, yeah, any questions out there? All right. Well, if there are no questions, again, we hope you guys join us out, uh, out up at the observatory because we are very excited to be showing you guys some of those objects we were uh, briefly discussing earlier. So, again, thank you everyone for being here and hope to see you here soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. It's a lot of fun.